I think the relationship between George Hallis and uh, Dick Butkus was uh, one that uh, could be a little bit feisty. George had full control, and so he had the contract issues, and he had the coaching on field. Butkus got a lot of individual attention. The old man himself, Hallis, would go one-on-one -on -one with Butkus. He said, Dick, with your intensity and your ability, you can be a great leader of this team. Dick Butkus was George Hallis's type of player. Hallis loved the whole black and blue approach that Butkus brought to life. But George Hallis also, uh, you know, loved his, his money too. Sometimes it took hydraulics to open up his wallet. Butkus and Hallis uh, had to be almost a father and son because they were so alike. George Hallis uh, was the son of an immigrant. He had one burning desire, and that was to succeed in pro football. They were probably in constant friction because they expected so much from themselves that they pushed each other, I'm sure, to the limits of their, of their patience. Dick Butkus came to the end of his career limping and all but helpless, his right knee ravaged. I just kept thinking back to plays that I was sure he would have made if he were healthy. My empathy was with him, but it was pathetic. There was a rule, an unwritten rule in, in the NFL, you know, you get him before he, you know, he gets you. He intimidated people to the point where they would never take him on face to face, so you had a lot of chop blocking and cutting at the knees, and eventually it caught up with him. Even in his final year, Butkus, at age 30, was still fiercely resisting against the dying of the light. He became like the wounded uh, water buffalo who was surrounded by these yapping hyenas out there on the Serengeti somewhere, running in in packs and grabbing at him. The saddest time I ever saw Dick Butker, it was his last game. And I'm telling you, he couldn't walk. He said, I'm going to play. I said, Dick, you're not, you're not going to make it. You're just like a wounded bear. You're going to go out there. And I said, they're going to do everything they can to take you out of the game. He said, I know. Well, at the end, it was survival. But uh, he, he was defiant and, uh, and kept on playing, just bone on bone. Injections to still the pain were commonplace and dispensed almost casually. In his last seasons, Butkus stayed away from scrimmaging, saving himself for the games. But during the week, a needle in the knee was standard operating procedure. Dick came into the league with bad knees, and uh, you know the way he played, it hey, couldn't help but get worse because you know he was taking shots all the time. They used to give the cortisone shot like, like they were giving out aspirin, you know, and they shot his knee. They beat up his knee. They kept shooting it and kept doing all the stuff to it. Ted Fox was the team physician for the Bears, and his nickname was from the players was Needles. Needles Fox because they would shoot up players with uh, painkiller. On the plane going to the games, Dr. Fox would walk down the aisle with a needle. All right, you're ready, you're ready, you're ready. You'll play tomorrow. That's the way it was. During those years, that's how you were coached. That's how the coaches learned back in the old days. Yeah, nothing wrong with you. You can walk and talk and chew gum. Hell, you can play, you know. The team doctors were really team doctors. They wanted you on that field playing. If you didn't play, you're, you're in violation of the contract. You couldn't go to any other doctor, so they had you kind of locked. I remember uh, the utter lack of communication at the time, because I remember Dr. Fox asking me off the record, who would have the uh, courage to tell Butkus he shouldn't play? And I'm thinking to myself, what are you talking? You're the doctor, because I'm not going to tell Dick Butkus he can't play football. And all along, he was sending reports while he wasn't writing what was really happening back. Then I had coaches, you know, start looking at me. They're, they're getting this report, well, he's okay, you know. And then um, they're saying, well, well, why aren't you playing? I said, well, Jesus, don't you get the report, you know? And, and it dawned on me later that they weren't getting the truth. Butkus underwent surgical reconstruction on his right knee in early 1971. Over two years later, in the summer of 73, he accepted an offer of $575,000 over five seasons. But by the end of that 73 campaign, he was relegated to the sidelines, a bear in name only, injured and frustrated and the subject of rumors. 
hard part for me during all this was not practicing, you know, which I always did. So that was hard to cope with. It seemed like I, I caught leprosy and no one wanted to have nothing to do with me. As the stories continued and the whispering continued and the radio commentary continued to pile against him, even his own teammates weren't near him when he stood on that field. It was alienation and it was Dick feeling lonely and resentful and angry all at the same time. George Hallis was troubled by the whole thing. He also had great confidence in Dr. Fox and uh, it wasn't until late in the game that everybody under, understood how bad Dick Butkus was. Every meeting with Hallis uh, was, was like a conflict and he had to win it. I asked him when is the last time he uh, spoke to Hallis and what was said and he said, Hallis said, expletive you, get a lawyer. And then Dick said, I got a lawyer. In May of 1974, just six months after he played his last game, a reluctant but embittered Butkus sued his beloved Bears for 1.6 million. Among the charges were breach of contract and negligence. Dick agonized over the decision. He was angry that this happened and that his first love in life had been uh, stopped because of uh, the knee. He agonized over doing it because he didn't want to necessarily do that to football. This was a period of time when he realized that it really was a business and that everybody was getting discarded uh, like a piece of meat. He wasn't the first one. He'd seen it with other uh, players throughout his career. And it wasn't just the Bears. Uh, this is what happened in the NFL. He sued the Bears because he had bad knees. You know, he had bad knees because he hit people a thousand times. Wasn't anything that the Bears did. In September of 1976, Butkus received an out-of-court settlement of $600,000. He had left Chicago, exiling himself to Florida. Feeling betrayed and abandoned, he confronted the task of learning to live without football. He was upset or, or confused about why he didn't get uh, any uh, coaching offers, not only from the Bears, but from anybody. There was definitely some bitterness. I think a lot of Bears fans thought that maybe Buckus could have became part of the Bears for a long period of time, but they knew it wasn't going to happen that way because the, the uh, divorce was so ugly. This is the period in Dick's life that he'd rather not talk about, nor do members of his family talk about, either publicly or privately. He would never, ever say that he was hurting. It broke his heart. It was his world, and it had been jerked out from under him. Dick came to Florida to, to mend and recoup and to regroup. He was depressed. He was, he was going through uh, the process of death and rebirth. Death as a football player and rebirth as, as something else. As the, the something else, he didn't know what it was at the time. He was in somebody's training camp selling Nautilus equipment and he dyed his hair. He was going through a kind of a goofy phase and he was bitter and he didn't like to talk about football and he never smiled during the whole thing. And as we were walking off the field, two kids in high school jerseys, uh, obviously high school players, uh, came over, they looked athletic, and asked for his autograph. And one of them had a big brace on his knee. And uh, he signed for both of them, and he watched them. He stared at them and watched them leave. And he looked, uh, and then he smiled for the first time. And he said, that one over there is a middle linebacker. A decade had passed since his retirement before Butkus was reunited with his Bears as a radio analyst in 1985. But still, there were hard feelings. One sore point was the reluctance of Chicago management to retire his number. There was several years of controversy. Well, should we retire it or shouldn't we? We need, we need the numbers in the 50s, uh, whatever. Uh, George Hallis and, and he uh, parted on, on bad terms. So there, there was a lot of friction between the Bears organization for many years. And uh, once he was, was burned, you might say, uh, he, he did not quickly forget what had happened. On a cold and rainy Halloween night of 1994, the Bears retired numbers 51 and 40. Dick Butkus and Gail Sayers had come in together, 
they limped out together. When I played for you, I gave it the very best I could. And so when they did do the ceremony, instead of saying, oh, they did it, you know, this is great, the press is saying, well, why didn't it happen earlier? Well, damn it, well, how do I know? Ask them. While his relationship with the Bears has been uneasy at times, Dick Butkus, the perfect bear, still had the respect of George Hallis, Papa Bear. In 1979, four years before the old man died, they exchanged a moment of goodwill. Hallis came out with his own biography, and Dick went downtown and he went to the bookstore and he said, hi, coach. Hallis looked up at him, said, hi, kid, and signed it to the best football player I ever saw. Dick Butkus was really startled with so many Indian people that he's met that they uh, believe, as he called it, the magic. We call it the medicine. Within Native culture, there's a sharing of, of certain uh, stories or experiences, dreams, intuitions, feelings, and, and that's basically an intuitive inner knowing. Dick believes in everything from ESP to palm readers, even when we were young kids, that he always seemed to be able to sense things before other people. He looks for spiritual things in all different areas, not only in the Catholic Church, but in the Native American culture. He's just open to hearing the message wherever it's coming from. The spiritual side of Dick, I believe, is um, uh, very deep. He feels that the, the good Lord gave him the body to play football, and it's uh, very personal to him. And most people do not know that, that side of him. While he was casting about for something to hang on to, something to sustain him spiritually, Dick Butkus went to prison, not as an inmate, but to serve a ministry. He felt a kinship to those doing time and found a certain solace behind the walls. It was very tough ministry to be in, but where inmates would not talk to clergy or anyone, that brought happiness to Dick that he, he would be able to talk to somebody that, that probably doesn't speak to anyone else. I think uh, he thought that God forgives everybody and maybe it was just a way of to find peace and, and maybe to give back to somebody that gave to him. When you're in prison, there's a saying, do your own time. And I think we let Dick Butkus do his own time when he was with us. Just let him be one of the guys and hang out and like we're all in the boat. Everybody thinks because a player plays a game tough on the field that he's got to be a brute off the field. Keats, one of the humblest guys off the field I've ever been around. He's a great family man, he's a great husband, a great father. But even Butkus' wife, Helen, and their three children have struggled to understand his complex personality. It's not like he has anything to hide. I think it's just it's trouble like conveying his, his emotions. I mean, I'm a son. He's trouble even showing me different sides. He's a very sensitive person. He just does a very good job of hiding it. But in private, things that he brings up that really hurt him would just surprise most people. He's almost completely opposite of what he was on the field. But, you know, that's him. And I also think that he could easily revert to headbutting somebody this fast. And because he's aware and understands of who he and what he is, he, um, he doesn't want to go there. That he is a sensitive big guy. But I would say this to you, don't cross him. Because you'll see that sensitivity go right out the window. Tell you, trying to get cultured isn't easy. Quite without warning and to everyone's surprise, the introvert turned into something of a ham. Dick Butkus found himself drawn to acting. He soon discovered that he had an aptitude for it, beginning with commercials. We're not just a couple of animals who can only play football. We can be civilized too. 
the greatest transformation in a human being that I have ever personally witnessed. We're looking for a nice, friendly game of doubles. Butkus went from this shy, withdrawn, retiring, uh, almost awkwardly shy person in a social situation to where he went out to Hollywood and became an actor. All these fellas that played with him, they all look at him like, who is this guy? One day he comes in, he's, he said, I'm, I'm taking Shakespeare. <laughs> I almost fell down. I said, wait, you're trying to tell me you like acting? I said, yeah. I said, I want to be an actor. His credits have piled up. Feature films, television shows, and numerous commercials. The acting, um, I think, is just another example of what made Dick great. He took his language problem like he did his football. He just worked at it and worked at it. He gets this tremendous anger inside and that anger is his motivation to outdo people and to, to, to better himself. To tell you the truth, uh, I think he's mediocre. I don't think he's good, but he loves it. He's not De Niro. It just doesn't quite fit, you know, the artsy side of Dick Butkus. It's a contradiction in terms, or it seems to be, and that's because we do make caricatures out of these players. It's unfair to him. He always felt that he had to prove himself again first in high school, then in college, then in the pros, then after football. And when he became an actor, he tried to apply the same level of energy to acting that he did to football. I knew I was not going to be one of the guys running across the stage in leotards. I've done over 200 some commercials now and uh, been a member of SAG for 30 years, but I can't get rid of the football thing. I can almost remember every hit and every tackle. Whew, I'm glad that's over because now I get to relax and enjoy my favorite pastime, barbecuing. And I found the perfect grill to do it with. He likes to go after a buck. He's got to make a living. And, and he uses his fame to do that often. He doesn't see uh, the problem with uh, using that name in ways that some people do. The NFL had forsaken him, he felt, but in 2000, football beckoned Butkus back. The bold and brassy XFL wanted him. He was 57. Being wanted again felt good. Smash Mouth football was our creed. The XFL. Dick was had his eyes open. I think he, uh, he knew why they wanted Dick Butkus involved in that concept. He says, if I'm going to be an exploited in any way, shape, or form, as long as I'm compensated, uh, he was going to get involved. Ladies and gentlemen, he is the personification of the XFL. He is Hall of Famer Dick Butkus. The XFL was all style, bad style at that, no substance, and all glitz, and Butkus was a testament to a completely different kind of football. People asked him, don't you think you're putting yourself down by going with the XFL? And Dick's response to that was, I didn't see anybody asking me to be part of the NFL. When you become one of the greatest football players in the last 50 years, you would think some of those calls come, and it's the get even kind of personality that Dick has. Dick will get even. The XFL experiment lasted only a year, and its passing was largely unlamented. But Dick Butkus found it worthwhile. He got the biggest enjoyment. I was watching these guys play that normally would never have the opportunity to go play anywhere else, and there were hundreds of them that would come up to him during that season and out of that league and say, Mr. Butkus, thank you very much, because we know you've helped make it possible that we can come and play. There are a lot of tough guys that played football who remained tough guys, and that's all they ever had. And uh, they became caricatures of themselves later in life. Dick hasn't done that, because Dick has this counterforce, this softness, this, this empathy, compassion that, that he learned from his mother. He's a hard read, he's a deep well. I don't think he understands himself all that well, but I think that Dick operates still from instinct and the things that he was taught will be with him for the rest of his life.
In the first game Illinois played after the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in 1963, Dick.